I'd like to introduce our panel today. Those of you that have been with us before, you already have met Janet Salopak, and I think that in the HR community, she is extremely well known. To refresh our memory, uh, Janet is the founder of Salopak and Associates, an organization of HR experts that specializes in human resources, strategy, and board governance. Most importantly and relevant to what we're doing, uh, Salopak and Associates has a program that is exclusively focused on not-for-profit. So I certainly encourage you to talk with Janet during break because there's not many organizations in Calgary that do focus exclusively on not-for-profits. Well, welcome this morning and uh, on this blustery morning. And I'd just like to say that I'm really happy to be back. And I'm happy to be back working with Todd. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. And uh, I'm usually I don't have a problem being heard. I'm usually told I'm too loud. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to be back. I'm especially happy to be back working with Todd because I have presented with him in the past. And I've quite enjoyed it. So. Uh, so Jackie and Nicole, thank you for inviting me to the table. 40% of the work that we do at Salopec and Associates is in the not-for-profit sector. Um, I'm proud of that. Um, I volunteer in the sector. I work in the sector. And I really believe that the sector, um, when we talk about performance management, has some really interesting challenges. And so I'm really happy to be talking to you today about the process. The approach that we want to take today is I'm going to talk about the bigger picture with respect to performance management, the found, some foundational pieces that you'll want to think about as you develop your programs. And Todd's going to be talking more about the cycle of performance management, so some of the specifics within the process. But we kind of will overlap. So Todd, if there's anything that I say that you'd like to contribute, I would appreciate it. And Nicole's going to be talking about succession planning, which is really part and parcel of what we do when we do performance management. So Nicole, if you want to interject as well, I think we should try to keep it fluid. So I would appreciate any comments. Great. Um, I, I came across this book about five years ago when um, I was working with some organizations in the sector. And they were really struggling with performance management. And it sort of, it really spoke to my core. So I decided I'd bring it today. And I'd really encourage everybody to find this book and read it. Because it will fundamentally change the way you think about performance management and specifically performance evaluations. It basically shook some of the fundamental ideas I had about performance management, and it changed the way I thought about the process. It basically challenged me to rethink some of my assumptions with respect to performance management, which was, for me, pretty powerful, because I, I live and breathe. Performance management today is a foundational piece. It's a piece that when we go in and work with an organization, we always take a look at, at their processes because I strongly believe that uh, without a strong performance management process, we truly can't be um, successful. So when I heard about this book called like, Abolishing Performance Appraisals, I go, what the heck? That's my livelihood. That's what I do. And so I read this book, and it really changed the way I thought about the processes. So i just like to encourage you to do that. And I just want to read a quote from you before we get started, because I think that it, it will open our minds to a different way of thinking about the process. And so the one of the first chapters here is letting go of a hopeless ritual. And it says, the world would not be saved by old minds with new programs. If the world is saved, it will be saved by new, mans, new minds with no programs. So what I'd like you to do as we go through the journey today of exploring performance dreams is open your, open your mind and open your thoughts to the fact that you could do something entirely different within your organization, but still create a foundation of providing great feedback and great learnings for your people. But it doesn't have to look 
the way it's looking today. So really be open to exploring new ideas and new um, assumptions with respect to performance management. And uh, I have this book, so if you're wanting to take a look at it at the break, just to see what the chapters include, please do that. So we're gonna get started. And uh, as I said, I'm going to talk to the foundational pieces around performance management, and Todd's going to talk to the cycle. And I really want to talk and provide that overview of when you're thinking about developing a new performance management system or even revisiting the one you've already got, what are some of the big picture things that you want to think about as you build your processes? I want to talk about the framework, and the framework being the business or organizational environment that you work within. So what are the things that you need to keep in mind as you put those processes to pl in place? And then the approach. Not specifics, Todd will speak to that, but this is an approach that you might think about taking as you build your, your process or you revisit the one you've already got. We'll just advance to the next slide. If it was as easy as this, we'd all don a jersey and we'd bring out our whistle and we'd get great performance. Unfortunately, it's just not that easy. In fact, one of the biggest challenges that organizations will say they have is with their performance management process. They're always striving to, to, get it, to get it better, to improve it. So what I'd like to ask each one of you at your table is just have a chat with the people at your table and talk about what are your challenges around performance management. And let's gather those so we can specifically speak to those as we go through the morning. So talk at your table. What are your challenges around performance management? And then we'll share as a full group. And I'm sorry that we can't give you more time at your tables, because I know there's lots of good learnings that happen at your tables. So if you started a conversation and you want to continue it, I really encourage you at our short breaks and after the end, grab somebody and talk to them and, and finish off your conversations. But can we just hear a little bit about what were some of the things you were identifying at your tables with respect to your challenges around performance management? We'll start with the back table. Thanks. I think one of the things that we... Uh, uh, get a bit worried about is not the fact that we don't have a good performance management framework, which I think we do, but I think we over bureaucratize it. And so, oh, okay. you know, as a result, I think our staff uh, kind of, you know, uh, are feeling a lack of engagement okay. because, you know, it's just the thing to do and, and uh, uh, it's, you know, another process, another checklist to follow another additional piece of work and so on. So I think for us, we really have to guard against that and pull away from that. Okay. Almost make it less formal right. without, you know, taking away the quality. Okay, thank you. This table here. Who's speaking? What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> for us, uh, one of the bigger challenges, there's no reward um, for actually doing them, we're not a performance-based, uh, you know, bonus-based system. So, what's the incentive to actually do them? They get okay. paid anyway. Just a bunch of extra work. Thank you. Okay. How about uh, the table over here? Um, That's okay. it's we'll funny give, because we're actually going to give you the mic in a couple of minutes. So you can go ahead. That's great. Thank you. Having not having a bonus gives a lack of incentive, but we're an organization that does offer a bonus and it comes with a different set of problems because there's um, a mindset in the staff that everything needs to be very measurable. Right. And then it's hard to um, have accountability on soft skills. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we note that, and I'm sure most organizations have this problem in this room, having a span of three or four generations in the office oh, space yeah. now, um, that there's just very different views right. and perspectives on management and right. um, performance evaluation for that. Okay, thanks. We'll go to this table here, actually. Thank you. Um, I think for us, um, we're often really busy in the nonprofit sector and everyone's doing double duty and we set objectives but we don't really review them for a whole year and so it doesn't really give 
the employees time to adjust or change if they need right. to. So it's more like a once a year thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's, how about this table here? <laughs> Last one standing. Um, I think we echoed a few things that were already said. Um, one thing uh, was uh, the new generation just doesn't want uh, feedback a year from now, just mm -hmm. more current feedback, more relevant right. um, and constant, constant feedback up from up, down, all around them. Um, so that's a new challenge to deal with. Um, and also, I think just traditionally, there's just this cloud of negativity about performance appraisals, performance mm -hmm. management, managers rolling their eyes, not again, it's that time of year. Um, and so that just clouds everything and also clouds um, any uh, interest in improving those processes because mm -hmm. it just, it, people just don't like them. Um, other than, of course, the HR people sitting around the table, right? <laughs> um, so that lack of interest is hard okay. to uh, address. Okay, great, thanks. And the table here? Okay. The table in the middle here. Maybe? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Like, wow. Don't be shy. <laughs> this will actually help actually Todd as well and Nicole as we sort of address some of your challenges. So I, it is, I know it's taking a bit of time, but I think it's important to hear what your challenges are. So go ahead. I think the only, it may be a bit repetitive, but um, the subjectivity around um, some of the soft skills and even just differences in measurement. Right amongst, the, you know, the same manager might measure their staff differently depending on who the individual is in their relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And this table here, and then we're done. Um, I think time is a big one, of course, and um, coming up with a process that's um, an accurate reflection of um, that's a useful tool instead of, as you put it, just a, uh, a ritual and, and busy work. Okay, thank you. So as we go through the morning, I'm gonna challenge myself to try to address some of your challenges. And Todd, I'm sure you're probably gonna do exactly the same thing. And Nicole, I'm sure as you bring succession planning in too, we'll try to talk to some of these, these uh, the challenges you have. But from a foundational point of view and that bigger picture overview, I really want you to challenge each and every one of you. If you're doing something in your process that is perceived as a waste of time, that is really time consuming and bogging you down with respect to hours and you're just doing it for the sake of doing it, stop doing it. Stop doing it. Get your leaders together in your organization and ask, is there a better way to do this? One of the things Five years ago, I, before I actually read that book, I was under the assumption that it was kind of um, a strict process that you had to go through in order to do effective performance management. I so know now, based on the work that we've been doing in organizations, that one size does not fit all, and it is not an exact process. We operate a lot of times in the gray in HR, and this is one area where you need to get comfortable operating in the gray and doing things that work rather than doing things that really you're just doing it to document. And we, in the not-for-profit sector, we, we really need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we have a process called accreditation. So we get caught up in that sometimes and um, we feel as though we have to um, do certain things a certain way in order to get accredited. And the thing is, with respect to performance management, the accrediting bodies within our sector do look for certain things with respect to performance management, but truly what they look for is a really good policy and the fact that you're following through with respect to processes and practices that support your policy. So start with a really good policy, lay it out so it fits your organization, and then do what you say you're going to do, but keep it simple. So if I can have anything to take away from you today, and Todd, would you agree with me? Absolutely. <laughs> I noticed when Todd put his slides together today, what I really liked is Todd kept it simple. And so when he talks about the process, so I really encourage you as you think about your processes today and, and where you take it from, keep it simple. And um, 
fit it in to what works for your business, what works for your organization. Fit it into your organizational cycle, right? So those are some of the things I'm going to talk to with respect to the bigger picture around performance management and what that looks like. So to that point, I want to talk about integrated processes and what that looks like. And when I talk about integrated processes, I want you to think about your performance management processes as something that supports and helps you move forward with your business plan. So you need to think of performance management in terms of what's your business plan, what's your strategy, those overalls, and make sure that you're thinking about your performance management process in light of those strategic pieces, your business plan your mission, your vision, your values. This has got to all fit with those processes. Can I just go back one, Nicole, can I get you to go back one slide? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I also want you to think strategically when you think about your performance management processes. So it's, it's that alignment, right, to help you. Performance management really should be a process to help you move your business plan forward. So think in terms of your processes, anything that you can do to help you move that business plan forward. So that really challenges us as managers, about anybody in the organization, to make sure you understand you know that business plan. We can't do effective performance management unless we truly understand what is the business plan of our organization. How many in this room actually know the business plan for their organization? Perfect, perfect. So we just need to make sure that we have to, we can't hold that at a managerial level too. All of your employees should understand that business plan. And that's a foundational piece I'd like to suggest with respect to performance management. Help them understand your business plan. Uh, and really, when we approach performance management, I want you to think about genuinely developing your people so they get it with respect to where is the organization going and how do I fit as an individual to help them get there. So whatever you can do to align and make that link will be a great process. And I often say it could be as simple as a blank sheet of paper that allows you to talk to them about the business plan and how they can impact it. It could be as simple as that. Okay, when we talk about integrated processes, I want you to think in terms of how does your processes with respect to performance management impact your mission, your vision, and your values because your performance has got to be the, the performance that you will talk to your people about has got to be linked to those three things, your mission, vision, and values. Many of us have mission statements that might be too lengthy, might be too long. I think what's really important when it comes to our mission, vision, and values and making performance fit is shorten it. Think about your mission vision in terms of one or two sentences that you can clearly talk to your people about. And continually talk to them about that. That's performance management. And that's the linkage that we want to make sure that we do from a foundational point of view. Okay, we'll advance to the next. So when we talk about integrated processes, I want us to think about processes that allows us to help our people understand how do we fit and the job that we do with the core purpose of your organization. So I work, we work with one organization and the way they've done that linkage is they have a conversation about the line of sight. And I love that. What's my line of sight with the mission and vision of our organization? and they make it personalized for every individual to say, what am I doing every day I come to the organization that's gonna help me move forward and help the organization move forward and allows them to, to, to make that linkage between their mission and their vision. And that vision is being that, you know, that, that core person, what, what, what are we striving for? What do we, what do we constantly want to be building within our organization? Because that helps your people make choices, right, when they come to work. If they know what the organization is striving to do, 
they will come to work and they will make choices with respect to their own personal job. If I need to, if I've got a zillion things on my plate to do, but I'm clear on what is the purpose, what are we striving for here, I will make smart choices. So continually talking to them about that daily is your performance management process. That's part of what you're gonna do as you develop your people, as you think about you know, uh, what you might do differently with respect to performance management is that that constant conversation you're having about how, what they can do to affect where you're going as an organization, to meet your mandate. And if somebody's doing a job and they can't see that link, then we really need to ask ourselves, well, why do we even have that job in our organization, right? So it allows you to have really good conversations with your people. And then there's that, those value piece. And we're also going to hear us talk about competencies, which competencies is like your values, your behaviors. What, what is important for them to be doing? How should they be acting in order for them to help the organization fulfill their mission and vision? So what are the behaviors that you expect from them daily? That's your performance management process. That's how you're going to talk to them as you um, come in every day, as you see them going about doing their jobs. You're gonna to talk to them about their behaviors. You're gonna talk about the consistencies of their behaviors with the values of your organizations. So three critical pieces that makes your processes that you're gonna develop around performance management, they're gonna be critical and key. And it's gonna help you realize, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? The pressure, you know, is it useful? Well, if we're talking about where the organization's going, how do we want to get there? How do we want to behave? That is great conversation. Your management team are going to nod and say, yes, I can have those conversations with my people, and they are definitely going to add value. Definitely. It's not going to be once a year process because you're going to be continually talking to them about this. You're going to continue to talk to them about this at their staff meetings. As I said, as, a, as, a, as they submit their work to you, maybe it's a report that they've done and you're wondering there's a disconnect here. That's an opportunity to talk to them about the mission, vision and values. Again, a process that's going to be continual throughout the year and is going to be linked to what you do as an organization. Okay, we'll just transfer. Uh, the integrated talent management too. So we talk about integrated with your organizational structure, your mission, vision, values, but I also want you to think of in terms as an integrated process about total talent management. So it's not a standalone process. It's a process that's really integrated with how you recruit, how you onboard, how you develop your careers, and how you do succession planning. What's the link there? to make that integrated. What are some of the things you would see within your performance management if you truly want to link it to all of these processes that we call talent management? What are some of the things you would see? Any ideas? When you hire, you hire for competencies. You hire for certain behaviors. You basically um, hire for specific tasks. So when you hire for certain things, you will also be developing your people for exactly those same things. So when you recruit, call out what they are, and then make sure that when you um, are developing your people, you're talking to them about exactly the same things. That's how it's integrated. How might it be integrated with succession planning? How could your performance management be integrated with succession planning? Nicole. Well. <laughs> the person who asked, we should ask that. But I do not hire unless I already have a plan for that individual down the road. Right. So, you know, it's one thing to say, I need a body tomorrow because I've got an event and I've got to have somebody that's going to distribute pamphlets. And it's another process to say, if I hire you, where will you be in three years? Where will you be in eight years? And will you be me in 10? 
And that's the link between the two. So uh, I don't know how to do any of this without workforce planning because it's going to impact the outcome of the organization down the road. We, thanks, Nicole. We had a, a hand up here. Can you just tell me your thoughts on the, that integration? But I also think that it's important when you recruit and onboard someone after the three months probation period, I think it's important to ask how they see themselves in the future with the organization and if they'd like to stay and what their career objectives oh, perfect, are. Perfect, perfect, yeah. So that's the, that's the essence, thank you for that. That's the essence of that integration, right? Your, your talk, it's a continual process, right? It's continual conversation, right? Whatever that looks like and whatever it takes to make that happen, make that your process and make it your own. I was asked yesterday when we were doing, because we we're actually reviewing a, a process for an organization right now, can it look differently for each of the different departments and divisions in our, in our organization? What do you think the answer to that is? Yes. Yes. Five years ago, I would have said no. <laughs> no, it's got to be the same. No, not with all the generation issues, that w the generation issues we're dealing with within our own departments. In order to make this relevant, it needs to fit. It needs to look different, and it needs to give you permission to have those conversations that you just spoke to. So think about your, your processes, think about this integration, and do what works. And if that looks differently in your organization, talk about that as leaders, and be okay with processes that supports different. Okay. Um, I wanna talk about three fundamental pieces that you'll want to think about in terms of your framework, and one of them being, which we've already talked to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about um, what are some pieces that help you with that alignment with organizational strategy. I want to talk a little bit more about competency and goal setting, and then I want to talk about how this fits with talent management and give you some food for thought with respect to that. So we'll just move forward. So the alignment with organizational strategy, so that's that's the piece that helps you fit your performance management processes with your mission, vision, and your values. One thing that many organizations are using is the balanced scorecard. Now, Clemmy from our team, uh, if anybody was here two sessions ago, would have talked about the balanced scorecard. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail with respect to it, but I actually borrowed some of two slides from her presentation to just talk to you about that because your performance management processes uh, will be strengthened if you do actually have balanced scorecards in your organization and or at least you're thinking about some ideas relative to balanced scorecard. And really what the balanced scorecard is all about is calling out within your, um, within your, your organization four cornerstones that you want to pay attention to. And those four cornerstones are finance, um, I'm going to get you to move ahead are um, the four cornerstones that you actually will speak to in a balanced scorecard is the finances of the organization, your client or your customers, your internal business processes, and your learning growth and innovation. So from an organizational business planning perspective, you're going to develop, or I would like to suggest that you develop some KPIs, some key performance indicators around those four corners. Those are your cornerstones, and that's what we call it the balance too, because you're not just looking at one aspect of your business, you're looking at four cornerstones, all important to your people, or to your organization. So in your business plan, you're gonna think about these four quadrants, you're gonna build key performance indicators in each one of those sectors, and then you're gonna work with your management team to develop departmental goals and objectives that are aligned with those four cornerstones. And then you're gonna take that down to the individual level and you're gonna to talk to your people about those four different cornerstones. That's gonna create that alignment. And people are all, are, are all of a sudden gonna get it. Okay, that's why I have to pay attention to the numbers. This is what is important with respect to customer and client services, right? And don't presume that your people know. Many of them do not. So when you're talking to your people, I'd like to suggest in your performance management processes, 
talk to them about the four cornerstones that are important to your organization and build your conversation, which is your performance management processes, around those four cornerstones. And that's how you're going to get the alignment of how you're speaking to your people about performance and making it fit with what's important to the organization. And that's where you're going to get measurement that makes sense because people are going to say, OK, I get it now why the number is important. Or I get it now why that customer service is important. Or with respect to your processes, why am I doing what I'm doing? And if some of our people are saying, I don't really know why I'm even actually sending this report out, that's a process issue. If they don't know why they're sending a report out, that's a great opportunity to talk to them about one of the cornerstones, your process improvements, and why it's important for them to figure out why they're sending that report out. Because if, they, if truly it's not adding any value, what do they need to do? Stop doing it, right? So it allows us, again, to talk to our people about things that are important to the organization. That's performance management. That's value-added conversation. Um, we have in your toolkit a example of a departmental um, uh, scorecard. And it identifies some KPIs. So I just would like to reference it and just basically say, take a look at this. It'll give you an indication if you're, how, can I ask how many people in the room are familiar with the balance scorecard and are actually implementing aspects of the balance scorecard in their organization? OK, perfect. So when you think, so that is a great foundation now for you to review your performance management processes and just make sure that you're linking them then to that scorecard, right? A great thing to do when you return to the office. Say, is there that alignment? The, uh, the toolkit just gives you an example of a departmental KPI that may or may not be important in your organization. In this organization, it was important. How do we measure it? And then how do we make those measurements relevant to what we are doing? So what you do need to do then is take these KPIs at a departmental level and be talking to your managers then about these measures. Because if these measures have been called out to the organization as important, then management need to be saying, and what are we doing within our department to make sure that we're living and paying attention to things that are important to the organization. So just an example of how you might um, start thinking about KPIs, having that conversation with your managers about KPIs, and then, then taking it down to the next level and talking to their employees about that. So I, we are going to take a couple of minutes and just have a conversation. If an organizational KPI is training and development, what might a KPI be for a manager in this organization? So you've got a toolkit in front of you that says, in this organization, training and development is important, and we're actually going to measure it. So what might be a performance indicator or something that a manager would want to pay attention to with respect to their performance if this is an important KPI to the organization? Any suggestions? Yes? Hours invested in training. Hours invested in training, right. That would be a relevant conversation for them to be having with their managers because the organization has called it out and said, it is important to us. Great. Anything else? Another example. OK, so they can say they're actually getting a certificate, or they're, they're moving forward their credentials, right? Yeah, and that's actually an important thing. One of the things that we want to make sure that we're not doing is just measuring for the sake of measuring, right? So we basically say, well, we, we offer all these great training programs for our people. But what does it get us, right? So we want to make sure that we don't get caught up in the track of just measuring for the sake of measuring. We want to be making measuring and making sure that it is affecting and changing behavior and shifting and moving us. So to the extent that we can, making sure that what we're measuring actually is making a difference. That makes it relevant to our people as well. And uh, because so what if we're just running people through courses, right? It's what's and, and what is that doing for us to make a difference? That's the relevancy piece. So to the extent that you can, when you're talking about performance management, make it relevant. Make sure that it's making a difference. Otherwise, who cares? All right. I want to talk a little bit around competencies and goal setting. And um, can we just advance to the next one? 
So when we talk about competencies, I believe when you're setting up your performance management processes, whatever that looks like, and Todd will talk to that, is make sure that you are calling out certain things. And I truly believe a foundational piece for any performance management process is to identify competencies that are important to the organization. That is the link to values, right? That allows you to speak and what behaviors and values are important to our organization and also to do some goal setting. And um, we, uh, we need to have both of those components in whatever process we do, do it however you want to, make it relevant, but include competencies and goal setting as part of your foundational pieces in your performance management. Todd, do you talk to that a little bit in your, about, okay. All right, and then you'll want to make sure that you define it and you measure it. And the way we measure goals, and I don't want to take away from Todd's presentation, is by putting together SMART goals. They've got to be specific, they've got to be measurable, attainable, relevant, and time sensitive. And this time piece here, uh, we'll speak to this and here. If you're putting SMART goals in place, you, it's not fair to your employees to do that just once a year. And you might ask me and challenge me, well, what, what's not fair about it if it's not linked to their performance management, or it's not linked to their compensation? What's not fair about that? What's not fair about putting goals in and then only visiting them once a year? And no chance for improvement. Uh, HRIA just put out their report card. And they said the number one reason, I'll have to read it here. I thought it, I read it just this morning in the HRA um, scorecard. Um, it says, organizations and down, downsizing, termination without cause became the number one reason for leaving an organization. It's not fair for us to not give people feedback because when we let them go, they say, what the heck? Why didn't somebody tell me? It's just not fair. So we really do need to put these goals in place and we really need to teach our management that it's not okay to do it once a year because if things go wrong and we exit somebody and they don't understand why, whose problem is it? It's the manager's pro problem, right? It's a management problem. So we really need to ensure that when we put those SMART goals in, even if you haven't linked it to compensation, you still need to be giving them feedback. You still need to be uh, helping them understand what's going well and what's not. Because I guarantee you, if things are not going well in today's environment, they won't have a job. So it's really important that we teach them to be relevant. OK. Uh, the third one that I want to think about in terms of that framework when you're talking about your performance management is making sure um, that it's not a one-off, right? So whatever you're doing is linked to all other aspects of talent management. And I'll just get you to move forward on that. And so uh, we talked about this earlier. It's got to be linked to training, development, career advancement, succession planning, and on all aspects of your, your talent management. Otherwise, it does become that sort of one of a year process. And I'm going to leave it to Todd to actually speak to what within the cycle, which allow you to help you link it to all aspects of your performance management processes. Because that's truly will speak to, you know, some of the things you will do within your, 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 your process in order to, to find that linkage. But what we do know with respect to the approach, and we've talked about being integrated. We talked about it being strategic. You need to keep it simple. Whatever you do, you need to keep it simple. And you need to keep it measurable. So if you take away anything from, the, from my talk is think big picture, keep it simple, keep it measurable, and make sure that you're having that continual dialogue with your people. Um, I'd like to just, I've gone a little bit over, but can I? Can, am I good? Am I good? OK. So can I just actually have a little bit of a dialogue at your, your table? And I'm only going to give you a couple minutes. So just share key thoughts as you've listened to me over the last hour. If you look at your performance management processes now, what will you challenge yourself to do as you leave here to make sure it's more integrated, to make sure that it's more strategic, and that it's more effective? If you could take one thing from what I've shared with you today, and do it differently when you go back, what might that be? Can you have a quick share with your, your people at your table? Okay, can I just ask for, um, 
can I, because I need to hand it over to Todd, um, can I just ask, what were some of the things you heard at your table? I know I didn't give you much time, but what are some nuggets that you might take from that to do something different when you go back to your workplace with respect to your process? Any suggestions? And if you can just put your hand up quick, I'll run the mic over to you. Yeah. Anything that you might do differently to tweak what you're doing right now? Yes. Get so we get so busy in the doing yeah. that we don't take the time to ensure that our staff, um, our newer staff, are really understanding the business plan yeah. and understanding how the work that they're doing is contributing to those overall goals, yeah. which then contributes to your strategic plan. So even though you're busy, I think what I took away is that we need to take the time to sit down, to talk with them, to share how important their work is doing for the whole betterment of the organization. I love it. I love it. If you did that one thing, mm -hmm. what a difference it would make. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share? Okay. They just don't want the microphone. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. And you know, I, I really, I'd like to, before I hand it over to Todd, I'd just like to say, and Todd's going to give you some ideas about how you might tweak what actually you're doing within performance management. But you know, a lot of times it doesn't have to be a huge overhaul, right? It can just be doing little things a little bit different and creating that focus to help people see that bigger picture. So thank you very much. And Todd, good luck. And as you go in and talk to them about the, the performance cycle now and uh, encourage them to think differently with respect to what they're doing around their processes and that cycle. So thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. If you've got questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer them and I'll stick around after the, uh, the session. So we have a few minutes for you to have an opportunity to ask the panel a question or two. I had a quick question about the uh, succession planning when you're looking around the, the room. And I couldn't see behind me. I didn't put my hand up. Um, as an executive director of a small nonprofit, there isn't room in the payroll for having a second in command. So what we look for, or at least I look for, is management roles within the organization that could in an emergency or interim take over in the particular department and then they'd work as a management team. Is that sufficient? And two, my other question is, most of the time when they um, recruit for an ED, they're looking externally because there isn't anyone, there's great expertise in the organization, no one that has the entire skill set that they would require from an ED, nor would we have the funding available to maintain a person like that on the payroll. So that's, I had just those couple of questions, comment. So a couple of ideas or options. And uh, certainly we don't have the time to talk about funding models and I don't want to put Pam in a bad position talking about funding models, but that is a good lobby conversation. Small organizations where we cannot have it built in, the natural progression, uh, unless I'm mistaken, most of us work with volunteers. If we begin to look at volunteers from a strategic perspective, not an extra pair of hands to stuff envelopes, but really selecting volunteers along the lines of the work that we do and therefore the skill set that we need, that becomes a workforce planning tool. And it kind of gives a little bit of a comfort zone to a board because it enables us to put volunteers in, in evidence and then instead of having to go to the broad community, uh, outlying broad community to recruit, there should be a philosophy of saying the people that have dedicated their time, their effort, their knowledge as volunteers, they become the first line of defense. So that is one strategy. The other strategy, and you just mentioned it, you said that there is nobody in the organization that has the entire skill set. So the question back is, what would it take 
to develop the missing component of skill sets so that out of that small pool, there might be an internal candidate down the road. I mean, this is not something that you do overnight. So if you have a couple of years ahead of you, it allows you to build in their current role some enrichments. What about uh, you guys? Any other ideas? Well, it's interesting. Um, I completely agree yeah. with what you said. But it's interesting uh, for, uh, for small organizations, we've actually put in place policies because the board wants assurance that it's being addressed, right? And it's a risk management thing. So from a due diligence point of view, they need a policy. But they actually outline the process then for those two things. What happens if RED leaves uh, in an emergency situation or that they retire? And they actually do just as you said, is they, they acknowledge the fact that they're gonna have to make sure that their top tier is uh, competent enough to fill in during that gap. And they also agree to who might uh, be on a volunteer basis that could maybe step in as to the leadership because maybe that's the board chair or whatever. But they have that conversations and they actually document the processes in a policy. And they actually have process then that talks to in emergency or retirement. And they talk about all good things about what's the communication processes look like when that happens. Um, what are the steps to make sure that we do know who the talent is and the rest of the organization, but they actually have those conversations and they document it in a policy. So even if you're small, you still need to have that policy on succession planning. In fact, it's probably mm -hmm. even more important. Yeah. Tom? Um, I think, you know, again, just to add on to that, uh, the buy or build, you know, strategy obviously is there. Smaller organizations have a harder time building it. Uh, and I think you're right, sometimes you divide and conquer rather than trying to find somebody with those skills. But it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning. We have to be very specific of what skills are needed, what competencies are needed in order to be successful in that role. And don't just look in the obvious places. You know, and I think it's right you know, to have the, the volunteerism, but you should build your network um, outside and just test people, whether that's through LinkedIn or otherwise, to say, you know what, we should keep conversations with these folks because that might be both an interim, a contingency versus a longer range, which may not look exactly the same as you have it today. And I think that's really important, and especially with where the company is and where they need to go. It's just like what I would suggest to add on to what Nicole said about succession planning. The first half of the day, I would talk about business strategy. Then I would talk about the people strategy that, that complements that. So are we heading in the same direction? Do we need the same set of skills today and in the future as we did yesterday? And that might be different. And that's why it's a fluent thing that you want to keep doing it. And as Nicole said, it's not complicated in the sense of who cares where you write it down, but it is a discipline. It's something that you have to have in your mindset always to be looking at. So be my and honestly, just to close on that question, it's cheaper than rushing out and trying to hire a replacement. The self-discipline is a heck of a side cheaper. Other questions? I think we might have time for one more question. But if I can just ask you that while we're, while we're wrapping up and um, facilitating one more question, if you can all take the few minutes to fill out your feedback forms in your folders, that would be great. Is there another question for the panel? Okay, we will wrap up then. <laughs>